Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Wednesday. Man, do we have an awesome show planned for you today. Uh, Anthony and Virgil will be here, but only after I talk to a man that I believe is one of God's great warriors, uh, John MacArthur. We've had some good moments here on this show. We had Vody Bauckham in studio with us uh, for an interview, and I love that. Uh, I've gotten to spend time with uh, Tony Evans in Dallas and attend his church and spend some personal time uh, with Tony Evans. Those would be uh, two of my highlight moments uh, from doing this show. And I think uh, this next engagement with John MacArthur is going to rank right up there with, or perhaps uh, surpass them all. We are honored to have John MacArthur, lead pastor at Grace Church in California. Uh, pastor MacArthur, thank you so much uh, for making time for us today. And, and I, I just want to start with the documentary you guys have coming out in just two days. It's hitting theaters. The Essential Church, which I think gives us a behind the scenes look at how you and your church reacted uh, to the COVID pandemic and the government overreach that uh, shut down or tried to shut down churches and tried to shut down your church and you guys stood tall. Uh, if you would take a few moments uh, just to tell us about the documentary, The Essential Church and what you guys are hoping to accomplish with the release of this in two days. Well, first of all, I need to say thanks to you. You're one of my favorites. Um, thanks for thanks for being a, a consistent uh, injector of Christian truth into media. I, I love that about you, and I do it really, Jason. I appreciate so much your your work, and uh, and your conviction and your courage. It, it's rare, so thank you, my friend. Well, thank as you. far as the, the essential church goes, um, we we saw the church largely kind of collapse uh, under the lockdowns. Um, literally, churches shut down everywhere, and particularly in California. It was, the, the attack on the church was, was onerous here. And, you know, people were wise enough to know casinos and marijuana parlors, et cetera, et cetera, can be open, but a church can't be open. And they knew this was selective. But churches continue to, to shut down. Um, and I felt at the time that whatever this whole thing turned out to be, even if it uh, even if it was more severe from a medical standpoint than it was, that's no reason for the church to shut down. Uh, the worse the pandemic, the the more the church becomes necessary. And when you when you realize that people are dying without ever being able to talk to their family, the heartbreak, the loneliness, the isolation. Um, this is the ideal time for spiritual ministry. And we were kept out of hospitals. We were prevented from going into old age homes. We were prevented from even visiting the homes of people in our church who were ill or struggling. So shutting down church ministry was not just shutting down an event. It was shutting down fellowship, the heart and soul and life of the church. So when it all kind of... Uh, played out, I said to our guys, I said, look, we need to make a documentary. We'd never done that. I don't know any church that had ever done it. But I said, we need to do that for two reasons. Reason number one is this. We don't want somebody else writing a revisionist history about what Grace Church did. We want to be the guys who say, this is what happened. This is the true story. This is the real story. Rather than wait few years and somebody writes something about it and spins it a different way. Let's let's let people see the hand of the Lord in an incredible way. And we'll put out the documentary that is that is unassailable. And secondly, uh, I wanted for the next time something like this comes to try to shut down churches. Uh, I wanted people to feel guilty. Uh, I wanted pastors to feel guilty to watch this video and say, "Hey, I should have stayed open. We we should have, we should have taken the side of Christ, who is the head of the church." 
and maybe this film will put some some courage in their hearts and next time it comes around they they'll they'll want they'll be eager to see the hand of god in a circumstance like we saw it john was your reaction and your church's reaction to the pandemic and the 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 plans to shut down churches was it instantaneous or was it the hypocrisy of seeing other things open allowing protests and riots or was it and as soon as they said hold on shut down churches was it an instantaneous move by you and the elders of your church like we're not playing along with this well yeah i mean my instinct was we're not doing that you don't have jurisdiction over the church of jesus christ you know you've stepped out of your sphere but at the same time we were being told that you know we're going to kill grandma and grandpa and you're going to kill your wife and uh, you know, millions of people are going to die. So initially, while I wanted to resist it, I, I had to wait to see just exactly what the reality was. I make a comment um, that shows up in the film that when it was first brought to our attention, it would have been no different than our reaction to an announcement about a hurricane and telling people to go to the basement because we didn't know the reality of it. But it didn't take very long. It was just a few weeks, and we knew they were lying to us. We, we knew the models were wrong, and I was getting a lot of input from some really very fine physicians and epidemiologists that I know in my own life, and they were saying, this isn't real, this isn't right, this isn't true. And I also, and Jason, you would understand this, I also trust the Lord, and I understand the fact that the safest place you can be in a situation like that is with a whole lot of people so you share their diseases and you get a robust immunity. You know, the truth of the matter was the LA Health Department at the height of this thing had to post on their website there was no outbreak of COVID at Grace Community Church. They were trying to shut us down. They were trying to clear the church completely and yet they had to say there was no outbreak of COVID and we were by that time, thousands of people hugging and singing and, and doing everything normal, no masks, no distancing, no nothing. So I, I think it was gradual. I, I didn't believe it at the beginning because I, you know, the flu had been around before, other viruses had been around before, and God has designed us to be, to be able to handle those things. And it was, seemed common sense to me, uh, protect the vulnerable people, and, and uh, you know, that makes sense. So I was resistant, and gradually, as the truth began to come out, um, we we started seeing, this is the interesting thing. We didn't announce that church is open. I was preaching to an empty auditorium. I was looking at 3,000 seats, and no one was there. I was preaching on Zoom. And all of a sudden, our people started coming back. We didn't make an announcement. They just came back. They wanted the church. And then in a fascinating uh, act, the Los Angeles Police Department started coming to our church when the riots broke out. You know, they we have we do police training at Grace Church. We've done it for years and years. We we let them use our campus to train. And when the county and the city and the state threatened Grace Church, a memo went out and the LAPD set this memo out to all the offices of the city of LA. Any action against Grace Community Church will not be enacted by the LAPD. So whatever they wanted to do to us, the police wouldn't join them because they they trusted us and because we demonstrated support of them. So here we are, a church that the city's trying to shut down, and Sunday after Sunday, it's full of policemen in uniform and their families. That was a strange reality. So that, yeah, I think they, they weren't worried about the, the virus. They were so browbeaten and hurt by the attacks on the defund the police um, agenda. So <clears throat> you're out there on the front lines in California wrestling with Gavin Newsom. And, and now that we're on the other side of this, are the people such as Gavin Newsom, are they willing to admit they were wrong and you were right? Or are they doubling and tripling down on being wrong? 
Well, they're certainly not admitting we were right and they were wrong. Um, what politician ever did that? Um, but they're not, um, they're not really saying anything. They're, then this is a time to tuck your tail and talk about something else. You know, let's drop the pandemic and try to become the president of the United States. So, you know, let's shift gears. We don't want to we don't want to relitigate this thing because we lost. Look, at the end of the thing, at the end of the whole lawsuit, and this is the most remarkable thing of all. They're trying to shut us down essentially for two years. We will not bow. We will not comply. Church is packed. In fact, we, we were so full, we had to get a tent like a circus tent, fill that in addition to our auditorium. We got a smaller tent, filled that. We have a gym, filled that. The place was just jammed with people. Uh, the, what they wanted was to shut us down, and instead all the other churches shut down, and all the people who want to want to come to church are, are showing up in our church. Um, it was such a dramatic, dramatic, uh, I guess you could say, resistance to the order. And uh, I think the... The, the the county, the city, and Newsom decided to try to sue us, contempt of court, fine us, threaten with jail, and we sued back. And at the end of the thing, just jump to the end, but the long, not a long story. The county wound up losing the case. California lost the case. They had to pay three point five million dollars in all the legal fees. And they had to give us a permanent grant of exemption from any interference by any authorities in the state of California. Now, how do you negotiate that? How in the world can lawyers negotiate a permanent injunction against anyone ever coming against Grace Church to close them down, pay all $3.5 million in fees? Why would they roll over and give that? when they wanted the, the opposite. The answer is real clear. After 12 postponements of the hearing, we finally said, we want a trial. Our, our attorney said, we want to depose all the health officials and all the city supervisors, county supervisors. So we announced that we were going to demand a trial and we're going to depose them. And that becomes a very, a very legal act. And if they lie under deposition, that's, you know, that's, that's a felony. So when we announced that we were going to call for a trial, 24 hours later, they said, what do you want? And we said, we want you to go away, give us a permanent injunction to pay all fees. And they said, OK. They did that in 24 hours rather than have to disclose the facts that really were the facts. I look at... Grace Church and I look at yourself and the way you guys handled this and it speaks to a message that we're constantly talking about on this show. Masculinity, male leadership, not moving in fear. If you follow God, you don't move in fear. And, and if you have the right male leadership that's full of testosterone and just is, is full of that healthy masculinity that God instilled in us, you'll make the right decisions. And so on this show, I argue that the matriarchy and the egalitarian movement is the biggest threat facing our society, civilization. And I'm just wonder. I want to take you down the road of talking a little bit about the SBC and what's going on with Rick Warren, and whether or not I'm right or wrong that this emasculation process that they're implementing and the silencing of men and moving men out of leadership positions is at the root of what's destroying a lot of things we used to love and like about America. Yeah, you are absolutely right. You know, the, the destruction of male leadership leads to just everything. Feminism, the explosion of homosexuality, transgenderism, all the chaos, the destruction of the family. The um, I mean, just look at the leadership in this nation. Every time there's an election, the, the body of people that are being elected is, is repopulated by more women, 
more and more all the time men are marginalized. No, th this has massive implications to the degree that now when we talk about our military, we're not talking about where can we find the bravest, most courageous soldiers. We're talking about how can we make transgender people feel comfortable in the military. This is how deep this goes and how how frightening it really is. Yeah, I, I would say, Jason, from a sociological standpoint, you destroy male leadership and you will destroy a society. And the ultimate end of that is, is so um, is so twisted that you have men wanting to become women. That that's how far they've sunk from the the divine design of God. And this is not this is not just a preferential thing. God's design was that he made men to be the the head of the house. They were to be the providers and the protectors and the instructors and the teachers. And uh, when if you want to destroy a society, just start there. Emasculate the society. And the weaknesses, look, I'll be real frank. If you want to know what's happened to male courage and strength, take a look at the White House. This is the best that we can put up as a national leader above all other people. There's no way in which you would see the current president as strong, masculine, courageous, with convictions, speaking the truth. It's the opposite of that. So that, that's, the, that's, the, that's where you get. You, you finally turn over everything to the weakest and the, the most uh, corrupted or corruptible. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And Grace Church... We, we need to say this. Grace Church is a, is a place that love marks us. People say that all the time. Um, there's a lot of love at Grace Church, and that's important to say because we teach the Bible. We teach it unequivocally. We teach it truthfully, and some people are offended by it. We teach that men are the leaders and, and the architects of the present and the future of society, we teach that God has an incredible role for women. We teach what the Scripture teaches, and yet it's not hard nosed. We're we're not unkind. We're I think, you know, the Apostle Paul said the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. People who step into the environment here don't talk about the conviction at first. They talk about the love. That's what draws them here. So you you don't give up you don't give up the the sweetness of relationships by having male leadership, you, you do the very opposite because there's such a sense of stability and care when you have strong men. How do we unpack that message in a way that, and again, we're gonna get criticized and you know, everybody, I'm, I'm a sexist pig and I'm willing to deal with that, but trust me, if, if when things jump off, women will be looking for guys that think like me. Uh, <laughs> but but sure. how do we, I, there will be ministers and, and men at churches that will watch this interview, and I would love for you to give them advice on how, how to unpack that message of male leadership without running off women. I think this is uh, a particularly acute issue in a lot of black churches because a lot of the women are unmarried, they're not covered by men, they don't have male leadership in their home, and so it's a tiny bit more difficult for men and ministers in those congregations to unpack that message without running the women off or greatly offending them, and, and maybe they shouldn't care, I certainly don't, but if you had to give them some advice on how to sell or, or you know, it's really just stick to the Bible, but if you could give them some advice, please do. Well, if I'm talking to pastors, um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say what the Bible says, and it's pretty pretty direct. Act like men, be strong. You go all the way back from from Joshua, all the way through to the Apostle Paul, and you you see that same that same thing. Act like men, be courageous, be strong. I, I think. Uh, it, it's the fact that you are strong 
in the sense of your convictions. And that means they have to be convictions about what is right and what is true. I think the great uh, demand on on a pastor, if he if he wants people to follow him um, for a long haul, is that they know this is a man of conviction. People have said to me, and maybe this will illustrate it, people have said to me, you know, you had so much courage through COVID. Uh, where did that courage come from? And I said, that's not courage. That's not courage. That's conviction. Uh, I, I, I know what's right, and I want to do what's right. I'm going to do what the Word of God tells me to do. It doesn't matter what it is. And others have said to me, how did you decide which uh, which issue to resist? I mean, there's so many of them. And I said, oh, we fight all battles. I mean, if you attack the truth and the Word of God, we're going to defend it. It doesn't matter. We're not looking to say, is it a four or a six on a scale of one to ten? We fight all the battles for the for the honor of Christ and, and his church. So I think you, as a pastor, they have to see you as a man of conviction. You, you can't be getting rich off of them. You can't be manipulating people. There, there has to be a sense in which they see the depth of your character. Um, and th- that's legitimate. I mean, that's what the Bible requires. A, a man of God is to be above reproach. That's where it starts. You know, you can talk a good game. But if you're using and abusing people or taking advantage of people, or you're wavering in conviction, you're sending a very confusing message to the people there. I think um, most people think of a church service as an event, and uh, and certainly in black churches, it can be a dynamic event, to put it mildly. Um, and that is that event. But behind that, can those people trust the heart and soul of that man? Is he Christ-like? Does he demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit? That's what provides the strength and conviction that makes people feel safe and makes them believe that that what you say is what you really are. There's so much security in that, so much safety in that. If you want to win your people, show them Christ in your life. This morning, uh, when I was working out, I mean, that's how I look so good. Uh, but on a serious note, when I was working out, I was watching one of your sermons and, mm-hmm. and you made a point in passing, uh, you didn't dwell on it, but you just made a point of like, Hey, America is not a Christian nation. It wasn't founded as a Christian nation. It, it, it made me pause and then you, you moved on. But, but I wanted you to unpack why you say that. Uh, because I think a lot of us do think of, well, America was founded on biblical principles and we were a Judeo-Christian culture. And it, it sounds like you disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. But nations aren't Christians. People are. So when you say this is a Christian nation, that doesn't mean anything. Do you mean by that that the majority are Christians, or do you mean by that that the powers that be are Christians? Uh, Maybe, but the truth of the matter is nations are not Christians. And I say that to say this, if you're depending on some kind of national Christianity to hold the line for the truth, it's not going to happen. Because as as much as we would like to um, say that Christianity can sweep a nation and take over everything and make a nation righteous, that's not possible. You know, even in the Old Testament, the, the, the nation of Israel, with the law of God, with all the blessings of heaven falling on them, were apostate and sinful and idolatrous and immoral. I mean, read the Old Testament. It's just constant. And judgment and judgment and judgment came from heaven on them. Even Israel, the covenant people, couldn't be a, a godly nation because it's the hearts of individuals that love God, that belong to him. So I, I, we don't want to expect too much uh, from the national uh, processes in keeping us Christian. Look, there's two possibilities. 
you can make laws that are Christian, and that'll make people Christian. Or you make people Christians, and they make laws that reflect that. That's the only way. So the church's role is not political. It's spiritual. This nation will change, can change, when people turn to Christ. When the mass of true believers have the fortitude, the courage, and the strength to honor Christ, when the church becomes the church, when Christian pastors and Christian leaders stand up like men with fortitude and courage and confront the enemy and do it in love and preach the glory of the gospel, nations don't change from any external force. They change from the heart inside out. Someone that has argues every day that, hey, we have spiritual problems, not political problems. Where many people think I go a step too far is I've never voted for those reasons because I don't look for political solutions to spiritual problems. And so I, I, I wanted you to, what is for a believer, what is our proper relationship with government? What is the proper role for government in our lives? Well, first of all, we are told to honor the king and honor those who are over us. And Romans 13, that famous passage, the powers that be are ordained of God. And uh, we submit to the government. We are, the Bible says we're to be good citizens. We're to live quiet and peaceable lives. That's important, quiet and peaceable. So um, we don't riot. Uh, we don't rebel. We don't hold a revolution. We don't get guns and shoot people. Uh, we don't march on places. Um, we, we don't use, I guess you could say, carnal weapons uh, to, to gain in some way the advance of the kingdom and the, the word of God. Th those are not our avenues. We live godly, quiet, peaceable, submissive lives to government. But when government oversteps its bounds, then we have to hold the line. Christ is the head of the church, not Gavin Newsom, not any other politician. The spheres are, are separated. The, there's the state and the church in God's design. And the state is designed to maintain social control and protection. And the church is the church. The state can have a, a ruler, and that's by God's design, so you don't have anarchy. The church already has only one ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ, who mediates his rule through pastors and, and shepherds. So I think we have to understand that if the church will just be the church, that's critical. Now, having said that, let me add this one point, and this is I know what you're after. I have to uphold righteousness. That means if I have an opportunity to vote for a righteous cause, I will do that. I mean, I've said it simply as this. How can a Christian be a Democrat and go vote for those who are advocating abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism, the mutilation of children? How can you do that? So on the other hand, as a Christian, I find myself voting to stop that because that's a practical implication of my biblical convictions. And it's not just that these are convictions that benefit me, but we're talking about what honors God. And as we honor God, you know, he blesses us. So I, when I vote, I think only of one thing. What, what is, where does this stand on the, on the righteousness and evil scale? If this is righteous, that, that's what I have to support. And that it's not necessarily easy to do with individuals, politicians, because some people may be Christians, uh, some others may not be Christians. But it comes, so you can, you can pick the person in a sense, except for the fact that if they are advocates of evil, then I believe as a Christian, I, it, my conscience cries out to me to say, no, I have to, I have to fight that.
It does, but I got to ask a follow up. He's advocates of evil is 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 a great position because so again, I've never voted, but I'm pretty clear that in the last election and the one before that, I was pro-Trump. And, and people are like, oh, Jason, how can you be a believer and be pro-Trump? Trump is so flawed, he's so flawed. And, and my position was, I didn't have this phrase, advocate of evil, but, but, but what my position would be, the things that he's advocating for, I'm not addressing his personal failings because I'm just as fallen and failed as he is. The things that he's advocating for, I don't believe are evil, the things that I see the other side advocating for, just as you said, abortion, the whole LGBTQ agenda, uh, and we're now looking at it in our face. They want to put drag queens and sexualize little children. I, I, that's advocating for evil. And, and whether or not Joe Biden or Donald Trump is a better person or not is irrelevant to me. I'm going to let God judge that. I'm trying to figure out what are they advocating and does it violate God's principles, therefore the principles I've had to adopt as a Christian, that's how I make my decisions. Is, is, am I thinking clearly on this? Oh, uh, that's just crystal clear, Jason. I know you think that way. I've, I mean, how many guys come on Fox News and say it's demonic? I mean, you see the world through spiritual eyes. You know, this is, um, the, the Apostle Paul said that. Uh, I don't know any man in the flesh anymore. Well, I, I don't look at people from the human side. I look beyond that to the spiritual realities. In, in voting for, for people, I, I, I want to know something about their moral character, something, something about what's in them. Look, um, but nobody's going to be sinless. So you could say Donald Trump has, um, I guess, pretty blatant public demonstration of his, of his, uh, the sins in his heart. Whereas some people mask those pretty well. Uh, if you wanted to compare the two, uh, Donald Trump is an open book, even to the part of him that is uh, dis discouraging. Joe Biden, who it appears now, maybe beyond definition in terms of corruption, puts himself out as some virtuous individual. So you've got to get below the surface of that, and it shows up in what they advocate for. Let, let me ask you about your own personal legacy, and I'm sure it's probably not something uh, you've given a lot of thought to, but those of us that admire your work and what you're doing and, and have done, we, we do think about that. How, how, what would you hope that people talk about you 50 years from now when they talk about John MacArthur? What do you want uh, us to be saying? Hopefully, I'll, <laughs> I don't think I got 50. Yeah, no. Well, maybe. What do you want us to be saying? I'd be honored if somebody said he was a friend of Jason Whitlock. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you have, you made my day at the start of this, and you just made my day again. I, 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 I couldn't be more flattered and all praise to God for just whatever it is I'm doing because, uh, I'm a flawed person, but well, I, look, I, I, appreciate look, I don't, I don't have any interest in um, maintaining some reputation after I'm gone. You know, I, I, I've said this before, but uh, when, when you leave the, when you leave the church as a pastor, uh, the Lord will replace you. It's uh, in a sense, it's like taking your hand out of a bucket of water. There's no hole Look, uh, God's leaders have come and gone through the years, and uh, the only thing I could hope would uh, would uh, be in, in people's minds as they think back to John MacArthur was that uh, he was faithful. Um, it's required of a steward that a man be faithful, that he loved the Lord, that he loved his wife, that he, he loved his, his family, he loved his kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, he loved his church. 
he was a friend, and uh, most of all, he was faithful to Christ. That, that's sufficient for me. Um, it's a small thing what men say about me. Um, the, the final verdict will be in heaven when when the Lord gives whatever tribute is Final is thing, legitimate. and I, I meant to ask it earlier, but, but I did want to get your thoughts on the feud dispute between the SBC and Rick Warren and the whole egalitarian issue. Do you like the way the SBC has handled this? And, and follow up, are, are, are you, I'm not surprised, I'll state it this way and then you can react. I'm not surprised that a minister could get caught up in his fame and adulation and think that he could reinterpret the Bible. Uh, you know, ministers are people too, and if, if they have too much adulation and fame, that they can make the exact same mistake. And, and so I, I, I see, my view is I see what's happening with Rick Warren is just a symptom of what's going on throughout society. Man wants to be God, and we've lost all humility. And that's going to be, that is our undoing. Yeah, that's very sound theology. Um, you're absolutely right. So let's just talk about Rick Warren. Um, you know, whatever you are as a as a minister is primarily defined by your view of Scripture. If you understand Scripture as the as the Word of God, if you understand that you can't tamper with it, you can't twist it, you can't alter it or you can't treat it lightly, or you can't manipulate it because it's the holy word of God whom he's exalted equal to his own name, you, you're going to be very, very careful in handling the word of God. In fact, there is a seriousness in, in what we do. James said, stop being so many teachers, for theirs is a greater condemnation. When you stand up and say, thus says the Lord, you better not be putting words in God's mouth. And you better not be taking words out of his mouth and twisting and manipulating. What comes across with a guy like Rick Warren or even Andy Stanley, another SBC guy, is they, in the hubris of their own pride, have set themselves above the scripture. That's a frightening thing to me. That's, that's really a terrifying thought. Because in setting yourself above the word of God, you have set yourself above God himself, who, who's exalted his word equal to his own name. So you don't see the submissiveness that should mark a faithful servant. And what's encouraging and discouraging about the SBC issue is that it's now fracturing and splitting. And it's splitting because the SBC has some people who want to use scripture whatever way they would like to use it, and the people who want to be faithful to it, and those two inevitably will split. Uh, that's that's not it, there's no common ground. You can't you can't take a person who plays fast and loose with the Bible to manipulate his own ends, and somebody who is profoundly devoted to an accurate handling of scripture and put Pastor them together. MacArthur. Thank you so much uh, for your time. It's been an honor. Um, I, I hope uh, to make it out to California and visit your church very soon. Uh, just thank you again for all the work you do, and thank you for uh, honoring me and our audience with uh, your words today. Thank you so much. I want to talk to you guys about <laughs> my favorite uh, partner and sponsor here, Preborn. It is my prayer that there will come a day when abortion will be abolished. Then we will look back and see the atrocity of what has been done. We're experiencing the impact of abortion in our lives, the breakdown of families, the trauma that comes from a woman being pressured to have an abortion, and the steep decline of mortality that justifies this atrocity. How then shall we respond? Do we stand back and say, this too shall pass? Or do we rise up and say, I will stand for the innocent? <laughs> 
Preborn stands for the innocent, the helpless, because of your generosity. Preborn is able to offer free ultrasounds to women. Once she hears that heartbeat, the chances of choosing life more than double. And years from now, when your grandchildren ask you, what did you do about abortion, grandpa, grandma? You can say, I saved a life through Preborn. I saved many lives. One ultrasound is just $28 to save a life. Just dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby. Or go to and donate my way, preborn.com slash Jason. That's preborn.com slash Jason. You know what? <clears throat> In honor of uh, John MacArthur joining us today, I'm going, you know, I do my little monthly deal, but I'm going to uh, give a little extra to Preborn this month right now in order of, uh, in honor of John MacArthur joining us. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks to the audience. Oh, wow. There it pops up my pictures right here. Anyway, uh, you can email us at fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. Tennessee Harmony with the Walker Brothers. Next. It's my obligation on hate discrimination raising up your hands for freedom. All right, welcome back. Uh, time for a little Tennessee Harmony, and we're going to uh, have a little conversation about the conversation we just, I just had with uh, John MacArthur. Before we do that, uh, Anthony will uh, bless our conversation with a prayer. Father God, we're thankful for your word on today. It is the word of God that sustains us and instructs us. Uh, bless us, Father, as we discuss uh, the conversation we just had, but also more importantly, as we discuss your word. We're thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, guys, I hope, Anthony, Virgil, I hope you guys were taking notes uh, during the conversation. John MacArthur, as I said in the intro, one of the great men, and, and I, I walk away feeling even better about him. And again, I hope you guys took notes on the nice things he said about me. Uh, could you and Virgil, Anthony, if you guys, I hope you were taking notes on that. The, the nice things that were said about me, I thought that was the most amazing part of the interview. And a teachable moment for both of you guys. Uh, <laughs> on a serious note, on a serious note, I, I, this documentary that they've done, The Essential Church, and the message, and I thought it was interesting, he said that they're doing the documentary because he wants to put pressure on other ministers to remind them of the courage and what they should do the next time the government says, hey, let's shut down churches. Because what I found fascinating is he somewhat indicated, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he somewhat indicated, he's like, even if we had congregated, gotten sick, and died, this was the right thing to do. Those weren't his exact words, but that was the inference I took from his words. He, he gave a lot of uh, fire to other ministers uh, because of that stand. Uh, one of the terms he used, and I don't want to jump the gun, but just conviction is what we do as Christians. That's what we hold on to. Uh, one point that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's like, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is profitless. Our faith is futile. So if, if we don't have the conviction in what we believe in, we might as well close the doors anyway. And that's without COVID. So it was the conviction that he had um, and, and that Grace Church had that should light a fire under ministers worldwide if you are about your faith, then truly walk in it. So, yeah, he, he did it right. Virgil. Yeah, I want to I want to start by saying, you know, I want to go back to the, the point you made earlier about how nice uh, Dr. MacArthur was to you uh, in, in this way. Uh, Jason, as I've had a chance to to be there uh, at Grace Community Church, interact with the with the uh, the leader, leadership. Uh, within GTY, Grace to You, it's the teaching ministry of Dr. John MacArthur. Uh, they are very aware of what uh, what you're doing here at Fearless. 
uh, and and are cheering you on uh, as as a team cheering us on uh, in the procl- bold proclamation of truth in a biblical worldview. I had many uh, uh, people there when I would travel to California ask very specifically how you're doing. Uh, wanted to know what you know what was going on with with Fearless. Uh, always prayerful, uh, but they but many of them had followed you not just uh, during Fearless, but uh, were were really connected to your writing. So I was I was very aware that his his compliment of you did not at all surprise me because they you, you're you're very much on their radar screen as a voice uh, speaking about biblical truth, biblical worldview. Uh, in a in a you know in a, in a secular space so to speak so uh, I'll, I'll start there uh, sec- secondarily to the to the issue that uh, th- that you raise as far as the the standard that the church is I love what he said when he talked about how uh, as it pertains to the particular issue related to the the COVID um, you know uh, wanting to shut down the church based upon uh, upon COVID. Um, I love what he said about the fact that he thought it was wise for them to write their own story rather than having some historic revisionism uh, that, that took place as a result of, of them not doing what they needed to do. So uh, it was important that, that they write their own story. Uh, uh, it was important uh, that they write it in a way that challenged others. Uh, and he even admitted, because there have been those who, who said, well, you know, John MacArthur followed everyone else at first. And, and he admitted, he said, you know what? We didn't know what we were encountering, uh, and in the same way that we would deal with a with a hurricane warning or with an earthquake warning, uh, we paused for a moment and then began to open the doors uh, to allow others to come in. And so, uh, folks, the, the 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 thing about the the issue with church in particular, and I want to I want to say this with, with clarity, is no one forced anyone into the doors of the church. Uh, anyone who during the COVID lockdown made a decision to go to church. That was a decision based upon their own free will determination that that was where they wanted to go. Uh, No one forced them to say you're required to go to church on a Sunday. Uh, It was a decision that they made uh, in full understanding of, of what the of what the risks were. Um, and they recognized that 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 was a decision that they were going to make for them and their family. So far be it from government to step in and and make commandments upon the church that are outside of their sphere of influence. Virgil, do you think I've misinterpreted him by he suggested that even if things had gone the other way and that COVID had overrun his church and several members had died, he still believes they they made the right decision and he would make that decision again. And and that's something that really, you know, hit me hard. It's not I don't have a death wish, Uh uh, but if I could die in service to God, Uh wow, what a way to go. Yeah, I I completely agree. I think you're spot on with that. He even alluded to it in a couple of ways during the course of the conversation when he mentioned the fact that he, as a as a pastor, was unable to go into uh, hospitals, uh, unable to go into into you know uh, elder care facilities uh, to minister to those in need, those who were indeed dying. Uh, that's one of the things that we as 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 believers should be doing, as definitely as pastors should be doing. Uh, we're, we're to minister to those uh, who are in need in those spaces, and he was kept from doing that, and 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 many of those. Instances, so so he mentioned it there, but I I, I agree with him. It, the, the idea that the worst thing in life is death uh, should not be something that's on the minds of those who are pastors. The worst thing in life is not death. The worst thing in life is life apart from Christ. And if someone who is a pastor can minister the gospel and present Christ to you, even as you are dying, that is the absolute best case scenario. That is the best thing that can happen because you've obtained eternal life at the end of it. So, yeah, I, I think you would affirm everything that you're saying. Anthony, what did you think about our conversation about male leadership and how to unpack that? Uh, to a congregation that may be a little bit more dominated, b- dominated by women, uh, what, and, and that's where he got into, it's important for a minister to be a man of absolute convictions. You've already kind of hinted at that, but yeah. he, he connected it to, if, if you wanna, basically what I took from that is like, if you wanna 
sell the tough messages of God, you have to be a great representation of God's will and vision for us, and you have to be a man of great virtue and morality and integrity, and, and people can see that through your moral conviction. Whenever God um, makes a move in his creation, when he makes a move, a mighty move, he always starts with a man. Now, throughout scripture, he's used women in great ways for great things, but when he makes a move, when he's doing something very mm -hmm. powerful in his creation, he starts with a man. And, and, we, and, and these are men of great conviction. Your Moses, your Noah, your uh, David, your, I mean, uh, down the list. And so what that means for us as men, if we're expecting a move, if we're expecting things to change, if we're expecting things to get right, we have to look in the mirror and say, it starts with me. Mm -hmm. and, and I like the line about conviction because notice when Jesus comes on the scene, most people knew about the prophecies uh, of Christ coming on. Mm -hmm. But when he called these men, they initially follow him because of their conviction in his conviction. So it's, if, if we can ready to do things as men, there, there will be some great men in communities that just stand up and say, hey, we're not going to take this. And other men are going to be attracted to that. So as it relates to leadership in the local church and leadership in families, men, you've got to stand up. And I know sometimes you may be in scenarios where, like you said, you're outnumbered. You know, there may be more women at the congregation, et cetera, but they're going to respect you taking a stand, especially taking a stand for God. It happens. Virgil, when I heard him talk about that, I personalized it, but also applied it to things outside of the church. If you're a leader on your job or in your career, or as Anthony has alluded to, in your family, if you really want people to follow you and submit to your vision, you have to be a person of great conviction. And, and again, it's, it's one of the reasons why I'm a stickler for time. Just, just show up on time. It's one of the most manly things you can do. Oh, he's reliable. He's actually going to do what he said. That, just that alone will get people to follow, trust you, and deal with tougher conversations. And so a, a lot of this, we hear ministers talk and we're always a Applying, our first instinct is to apply everything to the church, but these concepts and principles apply in all facets of our life. Yeah, abs absolutely they do. And, and I mean, I think that, I think I, I love where you started the conversation, which is you, you kind of challenged John, or at least presented to him. You even, you even put, you even pulled in uh, issues related to the black church. You say, hey, the, the, what do we do? How do we stand up? How do pastors stand up in the midst of of these congregations that are that are predominantly driven by women. In fact, within the black church in particular, when you begin looking at the numbers, the church is somewhere of the upwards of 70 to 80 percent female. Uh, and so there are a lot of male pastors who want to cower, uh, back down, water down, you know, certain ideas or issues uh, that they think may be offensive. And we're, we're witnessing that in, in a lot of different spaces and places. But, but I love what he said, he, uh, you know, what, what uh, Dr. MacArthur said. Uh, he stood up and said, we just need to stand up and act like men. We need to stand on scripture. Um, the other thing that I love is, is, the, is the demonstration of that. Uh, one of the ways that he demonstrated that they stood, stood for men, even outside of the church sphere and into the public square, uh, was when he talked about what the, what the church had been doing for years with police officers. Uh, Grace Community Church had developed relationships with the officers in, in you know in Los Angeles uh, to the degree that they, they did their training on their campuses. Think, think of the image of that, having police officers in uniform coming on church grounds to provide resources and training, but the, ma the masculine look of that. Yes, there are women who are in, you know, who are, who are officers as well, but, but, but think about the, the, the male dominance of that, of that view, of that look. They've developed relationships so that when, when the governor 
uh, wanted uh, the police to, to to do things, you know, that were outside of the purview of, of his, uh, you know, of his jurisdiction, of his order against the church. Uh, those men stood up and they said, no, we have a relationship with Dr. MacArthur. We have a relationship with that church and, and we're not going to do that which we know is, is wrong. Uh, and so in that way, they, they were able to take a stand. This, this relates not just inside the church, not just for pastors, but in every sphere of influence, whether it's, whether it's police officers, politicians, uh, pastors, uh, and the like, principals of, of, uh, in the area of education. All of these areas are, are important to see strong male leadership. It's critically important. You know, that point he made about the LAPD and their church's relationship with them and then how the LAPD drew a line in the sand. And that was really fascinating to me and, and really important about uh, all the time of, of be, trying to battle and feud with institutions mm -hmm. rather than be an asset to an institution and then seeing a, a, a return on that investment. Uh -huh. is, is, again, when you start thinking as a man and start thinking as a chess player, not a checkers player, uh -huh. how do we really move forward? How do we advance? This is the type of move that, that I, I hope that other ministers that are, are watching this or people in congregations, what, what he's talking about, that type of relationship with law enforcement isn't just open to white churches. I'm right. sure, Anthony, you can speak to oh, that yeah. in Murfreesboro. We, we've got a relationship. To be an asset and... We've got a relationship, we work with it, we have them in our congregation, mm -hmm. they're, they're members of our church, and backing up what he's saying and, and showing what it looks like practically, these men on a daily basis are standing, men and women, are standing holding the line for the law, but they're mm -hmm. putting their life on the line to protect others. So they're doing that every single day. But when they go into a congregation and worship and they're being fed the word, which fortifies them spiritually, which mm -hmm. takes care of their family, it mm -hmm. makes them say, hey, listen, I, I, I understand y'all doing all this with COVID and stuff, but whatever you're doing, you can't stop this because this is my lifeline. I can't stand out here for you if I'm not protected spiritually. So, so do what y'all gotta do, but we're standing our ground. And furthermore, listen to the language. How many times do you hear uh, Dr. MacArthur say in the interview that phrase, standing their ground? You just used it now, drawing a line in the sand. A lot of what being a man of God is, is literally holding the line. We're not going to move. Now, what you're facing, if it is strong or if it's about anything, it will bring up a fight. But if not, it'll go away. When they were bringing up this litigation and the case, MacArthur and, and, and their lawyers said, OK, listen, we want a trial. In other words, we put all our chips on the table. Now, who's going to be a man and stand up to this? And on the other side, because they were weak, they said, OK, what are your demands? What do you want? So again, it just shows, but I can say at least for what we're doing in Murfreesboro, that's the case. Uh, men and women and their families are being fed spiritually. Absolutely. Anything we need, anytime we need, we've got an event coming up, we need something, we got them, they got us. Uh -huh. I, I wanna buttress your point. You made it, but I just wanna make it so that even a baby could understand. Police officers, male or female, have a high risk job and feel like, whether it's true or not statistically, but they feel like, hey, I'm risking my life every day. And, and their relationship with the church, those of them that are believers, gives them the confidence, you know what, I'm gonna risk my life because I know I'm good with God and there's more for me in the afterlife. And so it, there's a great synergy between faith and high risk jobs, whether they're firemen or any of these service jobs where military people turn to, it's one of the reasons why, quite honestly, a dude will go to jail and, turn, and catch religion. 
because his survival is dependent upon his relationship with God. And so that's where there are these opportunities for men of faith and churches to connect with a lot of people that we've demonized and, and think are the worst people in the world. And, and you know, that's exaggerated because they're just not, they're, they're, you know, put in very difficult positions and they answer to the city council and they're just doing what they're instructed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I found that uh, very, very interesting and, and I'm glad you brought that up. The, the, the other thing that I thought uh, when I finally got to it at the end and I almost let it slip uh, was Virgil, uh, his comments on Rick Warren didn't leave a lot to the imagination. He almost sounded like uh, Virgil Walker there. Uh, <laughs> or maybe Virgil Walker sounds like John MacArthur. I'm not sure. But uh, he, he didn't pull any punches there. No, no, he didn't. I've, I've been uh, a follower, so to speak, a, a person who's been influenced in, in a massive way. Uh, by the by, the teaching ministry of, of Dr. John MacArthur, uh, 54 years of preaching in the same pulpit, uh, uh, verse by verse through the text of Scripture. Uh, the man has actually preached through every verse of the Old Testament, uh, giving 50 minute sermons on each, uh, uh, you know, on, on each verse or more. Uh, all of that cataloged and available for free. Uh, he, he's phenomenal and he's had a massive impact. So if I sound in any way uh, like him, as he sounds like what scripture says, uh, I'm, 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 that's definitely for me a, a very, very high honor. But I, I think you're right. Uh, you, you've got the, uh, uh, this, this, this thought process of standing on truth. One of the things that, uh, that he talked about was that you destroy man. If you destroy the man in, in a society, you destroy the society altogether. Uh, he talked about that, that importance, but he also mentioned that alongside those hard truths that get told from the pulpit, uh, he's involved in a very, it's a very loving congregation. Uh, if you ever get the opportunity to attend Grace Community Church, I, I, there's not a doubt in my mind that, that that's what you'll experience. The, the, the level of hospitality is, is off the chart. Uh, you'll not be able to go home and not have someone invite you uh, to their home if, if you're visiting there. Uh, it's just an amazing and amazing space. But one of the things that, that I learned from him uh, is, is that he said that he, he's always said uh, hard preaching creates soft hearted people. Uh, and and uh, he, he preaches the truth of the word of God rather than soft preaching. Soft preaching creates hard hearts. Uh, what happens in soft preaching is you, you've bend, you, you're bending scripture, you're manipulating scripture to fulfill the, the ever changing needs of a congregation. Uh, and, and as a result, their hearts harden all the more as you try to placate or figure out where they are next to, so that you can scratch whatever their itching ears need to hear rather than doing that. Dr. MacArthur spent 54 years preaching hard truths in Scripture, standing on those, and it creates incredibly soft-hearted people. It's it's a it's a phenomenal thing. As it relates to Rick Warren, uh, he's he's crystal clear. Uh, uh, and again, I, you know, that's that kind of teaching is the teaching I sit under, whether it's John MacArthur when I'm out there or online, or, or whether I'm here at my church under my pastor uh, as well, Dr. Josh Bice. Uh, they, they, we, we they stand on truth. Uh, they, they're, they don't, they pull no punches, uh, and they call out, uh, people who are bending the truth, uh, not adhering to the truth and they'll name them by name. And I, I greatly appreciate those men. What did you think, Anthony, of his, I asked him cause I, I watched a sermon this morning where, you know, he said, Hey, we're not a Christian nation. What did you think of that answer? I, I wouldn't have expected anything different. I, I get I got his explanation when he said it, but that's what I had in mind. Nations aren't Christian. The people are. Now, how we define that, people who say the term Christian nation, they're most of the time defining that as we were founded on Christian principles. Mm -hmm. But the Christian principles don't make you Christian. Obedience to the word does. So as he put it, Christian nation, we are not. Um, are we aspiring to those Christian values? Uh, we should be if we're not. You know, our, 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 we're, we're struggling in that area definitely now, uh, but I, I wasn't surprised by that. Virgil, finally, well, 
unless you guys, there's a couple things I'm. Let me I, let me, let me say this, missed. Jason. Yeah, please. We appreciate you, man. This this is a nice <laughs> segment. Uh, you're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, we need more of that. Uh, uh, I thought I enjoyed his answer. Uh, advocates of evil and uh, he, the the Democrat Party. And again, I've never voted, so they won't miss my vote because I don't have one <laughs> or I haven't exercised one. But his explanation, like, hey, man, the Democrat Party's made it impossible for me to support them. And, and that has certainly been the case for me uh, and until I am kind of fascinated with RFK Jr. Uh, I do think RFK Jr. is interested in the truth, and so... I, I do kind of like him, and, and it'll, it, even though there's several things we disagree on, including abortion, uh, I don't think I'll be saying much negative about RFK, but, but that Democrat Party and just their position on abortion, their position on transgenderism, their position on the LGBTQ, it just makes it hard for me, and I, I got a chance to unpack, like, because I've had this discussion with my friends, that like, hey, I get that Trump is screwed up. I, I really do, I, individually. But I just go back, are his policies screwed up? Are, are they advocating for evil things like I see on the left? And, and anyway, what did you think of that conversation? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I, I'm not, I wasn't surprised at all. I'd heard uh, Dr. MacArthur s say exactly what he's what he'd said years ago, uh, maybe 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 even going back as far as four or five years ago uh, in, in, a, in a sermon. And so I uh, was not at all surprised by that. I remembered uh, very specifically and it was probably during the, the election cycle with Biden. Uh, where he he had made the comment that uh, you know there's no way to vote for a, the Democratic Party as a Christian, uh, and and the reason w was and he laid those things out that the the things that they that they were advocating for even even four or five years ago were were mild in comparison to what we're talking about today with the advocacy of of, of child mutilation uh, of of you know of, of child sacrifice with with abortion uh, of all the things that we're seeing in the LGBTQIA plus agenda. Um, those things have been pushed even even further. We we witnessed the Overton window even shift uh, over the course of the last five years. So none of what he said at all surprised me. Uh, it was I, I thought it I I was excited about the fact that he recalled uh, when you were on Tucker uh, or on Fox and you called you called it demonic. Uh, you called that the, the behavior and, the, and and Tucker has been on record to say the exact same thing. His, his thought process was that you know. He, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, if we're talking about taxes uh, and you want to tax the rich or not tax, that's a that's a different conversation than the conversation we're having today, uh, which is a, around whether or not a man can be pregnant or, uh, or 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 a child should be given puberty blockers. Uh, those kinds of th those those kinds of questions now are, are really relate to good and evil, right and wrong. And so there's there's no middle ground. And so I, at not at all surprised. I thought his his language around that, the, the advocates of evil uh, was right in line with language that 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 you've used, Jason. Uh, you know, this is demonic or or that Tucker has used. This is good and this is evil. But we, we're, that, that's the that's the environment that we're in. And we've got to be able to call these things what they are. Did I miss anything, guys? Was there anything else that stuck out that maybe I, I didn't ask you guys about? I'm looking through. Uh, other I'm than the through. fact that uh, he wanted to be a friend of Jason Whitlock, <laughs> that was you missed that one, Jason. <laughs> he got better friends than me, but boy, oh boy, will I be? Will we be cutting those clips up and stuffing them, shoving them down everyone's throat? Yes, we will. Uh, you'll be seeing John MacArthur praising me several times a day on this show. But Virgil, any, did I miss anything? No, I thought I thought he was I thought he was spot on. The only only thing I I, I watched uh, as he talked about. Uh, what Christians are to do in this environment. I watched. I watched your expression of it, and he talked about Christians shouldn't be, you know, uh, rioting or rebelling, not, not creating revolution, uh, not marching, those kinds of things. I, I, I saw you kind of your eye, your eyebrows kind of went up a little bit uh, when he mentioned that, particularly as it pertains to to, to the marching. Uh, and uh, I, I I immediately wrote down in my notes uh, as it pertained to civil rights. 
there was a difference between uh, marches on Washington and or, or marches that were sit-ins at restaurants uh, and the Montgomery bus boycott. I was a fan of the Montgomery bus boycott where we stepped away from uh, what the government was doing with the buses and it crippled them economically, forcing them to make a different distinction about how, how blacks would be treated. I think that was a proper way in which to engage the culture. I think the improper way was that what we did with sit-ins where we're invading someone's business space for the purpose of, of having them enforce a law that, you know, a, a Jim Crow law or, or, or even a decision that they didn't want to serve blacks. We should have, we, we should have gone in to sit in. We should have made our own distinctions and decisions about our, our own economics. But that, that's a larger conversation for a different time. But, but I, I noted that and, and thought to maybe take a closer look at that. And I may even, uh, if I get a chance, which I, I'll, I'll be, I'll be in, in the area out in California sometime soon, may, may, uh, may circle back, revisit with him and have a deeper conversation about that subject. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because that was something that did raise my eyebrows, particularly as it relates to marches. And so one of the distinctions I make and have made for a long time is that, and I'm going to, because hearing him say that, particularly as it relates to marches, was the first time I was like, hmm, that's different. I, I need to marinate on that. But I think marching and singing gospel songs and song, We Shall Overcome, which had been kind of the theme song. That's a spiritual, hopeful, biblically sound song and, and movement and just energy that you're putting into the air. And, and what I've written about and, and talked about for years is we went from We Shall Overcome to no justice, no peace. Right. That's a threat. No justice, no peace is a threat. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, speaks to uh, the disconnect from spirituality, from God, from, from a biblical approach to change. No, and, and again, and I've used it many times to argue like, Martin Luther King and that generation was we shall overcome. Al Sharpton invents no justice, no peace. And, and just to me, it says it all about where we've gone. We've moved away from God. We've moved away from a biblical approach to threats and, 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 and threats and payoffs rather than progress and more freedom. Ditto. Amen. That, that yeah. You hit it. Yeah, yeah I, so, I, I, I completely anyway, agree. I, I, I was going to say, I, I completely agree with that. I, I, I wanted to add before, before, before you sign off that, man, I, Jason, I think you're doing a fantastic job here on Fearless. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful, man, to be, to be a part. And uh, I just wanted, I, just for the record, if you clip stuff up, you know, I just wanted to, I just want to make sure I got that in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I got, I'm going to be real honest here. When the man came on the show, and the first thing out of his mouth was saying how much he liked me, I damn near shed a tear. Uh, I, I was not expecting that. And, and I don't even know how I feel about it. That's a burden. Hon honest to goodness, it's like, wow, we're like, you better get, don't embarrass this man. Don't, <laughs> don't have him regretting endorsing you. And, and look, I, do I feel the same way about you and Virgil and yeah. Anthony and everybody? Yes, and everybody that works on the show, I feel that same way. But that guy is leading an amazing movement, not, not that Anthony's not, and not that your work with G3 isn't, but I don't want to embarrass him. Right. He just put his name on my name. Woo! Yes, sir. And, uh, that's quite a burden. So uh, if I'm behaving better, it, it, you know what it's, it's like? It was like the moment when Tony Dungy sent me a DM saying, Jason, don't curse. Mm -hmm. Man, I can't curse no more. Yeah. Tony Dundee's watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we'll cue up some harmony, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. How did we end up so divided? Stop fighting in the sand, Tom. We used to.
to be a nation, one united. Now we're headed for a downfall. Gotta let your light shine down. What we need more than anything now. Tell us